good afternoon, and welcome to the 2014 Jonathan Mann Health and Human Rights Memorial Lecture. As Dean of the Drexel University School of Public Health, I'm delighted to be able to host Dan and Dave Dornsife for this signature lecture at our school in honor of Jonathan Mann. Born in Boston in 1947, Jonathan Mann was educated at Harvard before earning his medical degree from the Washington University School of Medicine in 1974 and an MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health in 1980. He worked as an epidemiologist for the Centers for Disease Control and served a decade in the public health department of New Mexico. In the early 1980s, Dr. Mann was recruited by the CDC to join a team of specialists investigating links between cases of a mysterious deadly illness that was appearing in the United States and in Africa. The disease turned out to be AIDS. As a result of his work on AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa, Jonathan Mann was appointed the first director of the World Health Organization's global program on AIDS. In 1998, after founding a center at Harvard University dedicated to health and human rights, he was recruited to lead a brand new school of public health at the Allegheny University of the Health Sciences. That school is now known as the Drexel University School of Public Health. Unfortunately, Dr. Mann's tenure was all too brief on September 2nd, 1998, he and his wife, Mary Lou Clements, died in a plane crash on their way to a UN AIDS vaccine conference in Geneva. Jonathan Mann's public health experience in the United States and Africa emphasized to him the inextricable links between health and human rights. He was convinced that controlling an epidemic was impossible if human lives were not valued equally and argued that health and disease should be viewed not only as medical, but also as a social issue. In reflecting on the experience with the AIDS epidemic, he said the following, in the last few years, we have gained confidence that, that as individuals and all together, we are not condemned passively to allow the disease AIDS or the fears and forces which it can unleash to dominate us. Against AIDS, we will prevail together for we will refuse to be split or to cast into the shadows those persons, groups, and nations that are affected. This quote could not be more timely today as we grapple with the Ebola epidemic. In 1998, as the brand new dean of our school, he stated, this school of public health is founded on a commitment, a commitment to public health as social justice. We see health not as privilege, but as a right. Today, we continue to honor this commitment by having all of our incoming students recite the preamble to the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This principle permeates all that we do at our school, nationally as well as globally, and is indeed one of our distinguishing features. After hearing about Jonathan Mann's legacy, I'm sure you'll understand why Dana and Dave Dornsife, with their enduring commitment to improving health in Africa through access to safe water, and what could be more of a human right than access to water? And through their generous support for educational programs like the Dornsife Global Development Scholars are such an outstanding choice for our Jonathan Mann Lecture and why we are so thrilled to have them with us today. But now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the president of Drexel University, John Fry, who will introduce to you our honored guest speakers. Thank you, Anna. I know I speak on behalf of the entire Drexel community in saying how happy we are to welcome you to our university. And it's such a privilege um, to have one of the nation's most accomplished public health researchers at the helm of our great school of public health. So welcome, Anna. I also want to extend a warm welcome to Marla Gold, who is now Professor of Health Management and Policy and Dean Emeritus of our School of Public Health. Over the past decade, Marla's leadership helped the school make enormous strides in advancing health equity and reducing racial and ethnic health disparities. Welcome, Marla. <laughs> 
We're also joined by Jerry Miller and his wife, Lois. Jerry is the new chairman of the School of Public Health Advisory Council. Jerry, thank you for your wisdom and your service. And I believe that Josephine Mandeville will be with us this evening. Josephine is the chair, president, and CEO of the Connolly Foundation and a great friend and champion for the School of Public Health. The school's beautiful, renovated home here in Nesbitt Hall owes a great deal to the Connolly Foundation's generosity, and we'll be all together, I think, later this month to thank her in person. Finally, I want to thank Walter Cohen, Chancellor Emeritus of the College of Medicine. Walter, unfortunately, could not join us this evening. He wanted me to express uh, his, uh, his regrets. Uh, and through Walter's generosity, he endowed the Jonathan Mann Health and Human Rights Memorial Lecture Program. So, of course, I am especially honored to be at this Mann Lecture to celebrate, of course, Dr. Jonathan Mann, one of the great health and human rights leaders in American history, and to, do, and to introduce our speakers, Dana and David Dornsife. It humbles me now to review the scope of Dana and David's humanitarian endeavors. Their philanthropy has fueled initiatives in higher education, in medical research, and in environmental preservation. The Lazarex Cancer Foundation, founded and run by Dana, helps end-stage cancer patient, patients take advantage of clinical trials. And their extraordinary work with the humanitarian organization World Vision, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, makes life-saving improvements to water, sanitation, and hygiene conditions in rural communities throughout Africa. It's a real badge of pride for this university that Dana, class of 1983, is an alumna, and that Dana and David accepted honorary degrees from Drexel just this past June. So Dana and David's generosity is at the heart of some of Drexel's most exciting initiatives. The Dornsife Office of Experiential Learning promotes academic excellence in the LeBeau College of Business. And the Dornsife Center for Neighborhood Partnerships, which officially opened this past June, is a brand new model for community outreach and civic engagement right here in West Philadelphia. And most recently, Dana and David established the Dornsife Global Development Scholars Program at Drexel. The program embodies our joint commitment to Jonathan Mann's philosophy of public health as an inalienable right. The program is directed by Shannon Marquez, Director of Global Health Initiatives at the School of Public Health. It connects university and world vision to put talented Drexel students on the ground to help prevent the spread of waterborne illnesses in 10 African countries. So I was a great admirer of Dana and David's work with World Vision, but for a long time I only knew it by the numbers. 2.6 billion people worldwide don't have access to adequate sanitation. 884 million don't have access to safe water supplies. But 4 million and counting lives have been touched by Dana and David's efforts in more than 22 African nations. And then David and Dana invited me to accompany them to Ethiopia. Their enthusiasm for the cause was hard to resist, so off I went. And that's when the numbers became real. I saw firsthand the incredible scope of their, well, of their well drilling and safe water education projects. And I spent time with the people whose lives they were helping to change. It was, for me, a truly life-changing experience. And it drove home the potential impact of taking the Dornsife drexel partnership to a global scale. A deep faith and spirituality is at the foundation of Dana and David's service and philanthropy. In a Drexel Magazine article last year, they mentioned their adherence to the biblical adage of giving back with time, talent, and treasure. But to this, they added a fourth, trenches. Their philosophy was beautifully expressed by Dana, who said, we get rewarded by changing lives, but you really don't understand what people need and you really don't understand if your giving is having an impact unless you roll up your sleeves and go into the trenches. So we're fortunate, very fortunate, for this opportunity 
to learn from Dana and from David. Their unique perspective is forged by their passion for working on the ground, for getting their hands dirty, and for engaging one-on-one -on -one with those whom we serve. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce Dana and David Dornside. So what we'd like to talk about tonight is a program that we're working on in Africa through World Vision called WASH, W-A-S-H. The WASH program is made up of three separate areas, water, sanitation, and hygiene. Now John talked about the worldwide challenge, but specifically in Africa, there are 345 million people without access to clean water, and worldwide, a child dies every 21 seconds from a waterborne disease, most commonly um, diarrhea. So we started out, did it work? Yes. Yes? Uh, we began, as John said, working in 10 countries, uh, and uh, in West Africa, we worked in Ghana, Mali, and Niger, in South Africa, Southern Africa, Zambia, Malawi, and Mozambique. I can port some of these out. Would that help? Or, or, um, be, so West Africa is uh, Ghana, Mali, Niger. Uh, South Africa is Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique. In East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. And then John had mentioned we expanded that to 22 total countries. So in, in West Africa, we added Mauritania, Senegal, Sierra Leone, which is in the news every day, and a really bad place, Chad. In East Africa, we added uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Burundi. And in South Africa, we added Zambia, Swaziland, Angola, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which totals 22 countries. Um, separately, we're working in West Africa. In, we opened an office in March in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, with another nonprofit called ECHO, E-C-H-O, and their mission is to bring agricultural increases. So we worked our way through West Africa on the water. Now we're following with agriculture. We chose to work in Africa because we had access to very experienced personnel and management through World Vision. World Vision is an international Christian relief group organization that administers its services through what they call an area development program. And they take um, a group of villages from several hundred to several thousand people, and they work with them over a period of up to 15 years, trying to change their quality of life and uh, education, food. Um, I'm smiling at the two students that have been over, because uh, they, they, they have the drill. And uh, then during the middle of the time that we're there, say a couple of years in, we bring the water in to the ADP. Why are we doing this? Uh, Dana will show you some of the conditions that we encounter prior to our wash program. For rural villagers, uh, life is very difficult in Africa. Every day, women face the enormous challenge of simply keeping their families alive. The one thing they need most is the one thing they have the least of, clean water. Rivers, ponds, and seasonal springs are the most common places to gather water. This woman is gathering water from a local water hole. The water is obviously contaminated, but this is the only source for this village of about 300 people. Yeah, you need to go back. There you go. Okay. So it's my first assignment. 
<laughs> in this case, with a baby on her back, this woman has to use a cup to fill her bucket because the water source has almost completely dried up and is too shallow to scoop up water with the bucket. Again, another uh, source of obviously contaminated water. Again, the, only, the village's only supply. In Africa, the average distance a woman must walk to a source of water is nearly seven kilometers round trip. So can you imagine walking the equivalent of 4.2 miles, perhaps several times each day, to provide your family with adequate water and knowing that that water is pr most probably contaminated and is going to make your family sick? Unfortunately, these women don't have to imagine because this is their reality every single day. And so the women and their children walk, instead of going to school, forming water caravans, going to the nearest source of water. Safe water, one of the basic necessities of life, is especially critical for children who are the most vulnerable to water-related diseases. Lack of access to clean water and good sanitation and hygiene practices has a profound effect on every aspect of life. And you have to consider the entire impact in order to understand the severity of this issue. In Africa, millions of hours are lost annually because women and their children must collect and haul water for home use, again, which is almost always contaminated. Hours that could be spent on childcare and development, education, agricultural production, and life-sustaining economic activities. In addition, this contaminated water also causes disease and sickness. I'll turn over to you. <laughs> so uh, when a, a river or a stream is not uh, close by, uh, you have to go to a hand-dug well. Um, you notice we're sharing it with one of our friends. and. So that just adds contamination and so forth to it. And um, we wound up in a situation where we went in right next to a village that had been digging a well for one year. They had, uh, we went and did the hole and then we needed to send the water sample into World Health Organization certified lab before we could do it. So the village elected to continue to dig the hole. So, we're in a situation where at this point they had worked one year, they were down 130 feet and based on the distance we had to go nearby to get water, they had another 130 feet and a year to go. It's a uh, felony offense in the United States if you dig an unsupported hole deeper than five feet and it caves in and kills somebody or hurts somebody. So in this case, there are people down in here being held by the ropes, and then you also use that to bring the buckets out uh, of dirt when they uh, are done. Tie the ropes to the men, lower them down in, and then up to 260 feet of freestanding wall. And then every few hours, go ahead, every few hours, you pull them out. And uh, he's been down there for a couple hours. You pull him out and let some other guys in. And if a cave-in starts, you just pull as hard as you can to get him out. So there's a lot more problems with the well than might be normally thought. So we're all familiar with or have at least heard about conditions like chronic diarrhea and diseases such as cholera, typhoid, and malaria. Diseases that we don't have to be concerned with any longer in the United States because we have access to clean water and we have good sanitation and hygiene practices. In Africa, death by these diseases is common, especially amongst children. <laughs> Let's talk about a few diseases that we're not familiar with in the United States. Guinea worm is an example of a waterborne disease caused by a parasite. This young girl is at a local medical clinic in Ghana for a guinea worm extraction. There is no medicine that you can take for guinea worm 
and as the worm approaches maturity, it's very painful and leaves its victim feeling sick and completely drained of energy. The cycle is as follows. People swallow the larva that causes guinea worm when they drink contaminated water. It takes about 12 months for the guinea worm to mature. The worm typically migrates to the lower extremities of the body um, where it secretes an enzyme that forms a blister on the skin. And when its host goes back into the water and the worm detects that you know, it, it's back in contact with water, it um, uh, basically releases thousands of larvae. The person who's in the water drinks the contaminated water all over <coughs> again, and the cycle just repeats itself over and over and over. So this is a guinea worm extraction uh, in process. Using a device that resembles a crochet hook, the clinician hooks the worm through a slit in the skin and begins to pull it out. And they have to actually be very careful when they're doing this because the worm can actually break off and regenerate. Um, here the extraction is almost completed. This worm is 25 inches long. And it's not unusual for people to have more than one worm at a time. And um, just so you know, th this is not a medical device. This is the actual worm that they're extracting from this 13-year-old uh, girl's leg. Another disease that's easily managed with the availability of safe water is trachoma. Trachoma is caused by a bacteria called chlamydia, which is contagious. There are four stages of, of trachoma. The first two can be treated with antibiotics. However, in Africa, that's really not a sustainable cure because people are constantly exposed to the bacteria and, in, and um, the infection occurs over and over again. We are all constantly uh, exposed to chlamydia, but we don't get trachoma because we have access to clean water for hygiene purposes. A child who suffers from trachoma may be blind by the age of 10 years old. According to the World Health Organization, worldwide, currently 8 million people are visually impaired by trachoma, and there are 80, I'm sorry, yeah, 84 million active cases of the disease. You can see here where the scar tissue is building up under her eyelid, um, where the, um, the underneath uh, of the lid is white as opposed to a healthy red um, tissue that's normally makes up the eyelid. So repeated exposure to the bacteria causes a buildup of the scar tissue, and eventually the eyelids turn under, causing um, your eyelashes to abrade your eye, ultimately leading to blindness. Here is an advanced case where the cornea is continuously abraded by the lashes of the turned under eyelid. This woman is completely blind, obviously suffers through every day. Her eyes are constantly weeping. She is in constant pain. And, you know, you know what it's like to have something in your eye. You get an eyelash in your eye. I mean, you have to, whatever you're doing, stop whatever you're doing and take care of it. And um, she, she lives with that every moment of every day. You can see the opacity of her cornea, preventing her from seeing anything at all. In some instances, trachoma affects up to 40% of a village causing additional burden to an already burdened community. The most staggering statistic about trachoma is that one tablespoon of clean water daily, a, a pondful of water wiped across your eyes, is enough to prevent the disease from occurring at all. So we've shown you the conditions that exist in many parts of rural Africa, and you now have a better understanding of the impact that lack of access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene can have. And so the most important question that we have tonight to ask is, what are we doing about it? 
clean water is not enough. We need to take a holistic approach that includes water, sanitation, and hygiene to bring about the behavioral changes needed to improve the quality of life and prevent disease. And it all has to be done in a sustainable way. Our mantra is sustainable, sustainable, sustainable. John made reference to um, the our fourth T, uh, the trenches. And um, Dave and I believe it's imperative to have a firsthand understanding of the problem and witness the effects of your proposed solutions in order to achieve positive and sustainable results. So I'd like to share with you a story about a group of well-meaning people who spent a lot of time and money to bring water to a village in Samburu, Kenya. A nonprofit from Sweden installed a state-of-the-art diesel engine-driven pump system along with piping, valves, and a holding tank for a village of about 400 people. The installation cost was about $75,000. The installation was completed. The Swedish group celebrated their success with the villagers, and they returned home. Dave and I happened to be in this village 28 days later. All of the valves were ruined. The engine was seized from dirty fuel and oil, so the pump no longer worked. No one took the time to work with the villagers to teach them about maintenance and operation of the pump. And the nearest source of clean diesel fuel was hours away by, it, by a Jeep. And they don't have Jeeps. This was an unfortunate development and one that could have been avoided. The decisions about design and installation of the system were made in Sweden instead of on the ground in Samburu where they could take into consideration the many factors that could affect the ultimate outcome. I'm certain this group of people would be devastated to know that their project was defunct in a matter of weeks and the villages were back to using contaminated water sources. But they're not alone. Our own personal experience involved years of building a sustainable water project in West Africa beginning in 1999 with World Vision. We had many wins, but also our share of misses. We regrouped and refined our approach to achieve better results over time. By 2009, we were bringing water and with some inconsistency, sanitation and hygiene to 200,000 new people a year. In 2010, based on the results of the program, the quality of the management team, and improvements in technology, we approached World Vision about ramping things up. We made a significant multi-year commitment that was a funding keystone and attracted new financial partners. We now have an expanded WASH program in 22 countries throughout Africa, moving toward our new goal of serving nearly three million new people per year by 2016. And in many villages, the sanitation, latrine construction, and hygiene components are approaching 100% within individual homes. The point is that if we weren't in the trenches and didn't go to Africa every year to be involved in the work, we wouldn't have developed better solutions and recognized the opportunity to ramp up the program. In the sustainability category, after 20 years, 79% of World Vision wells are still functioning, which is far above the norm. At the UN Water Conference in Stockholm in 2010, the UN presented that only 50% of non-governmental organization wells installed were still operating after three years, and 20% at five years. So how do we get the job done? Um, so there's, there's many ways of, of capturing the water. This is, one of these is the way that John actually visited with us. And this is a, a rock catchment built on a stream that came out of the side of a mountain. 
and, and, and it would capture that. It, uh, it varies between the potential length of the pipe, but it can, it can uh, if it's built correctly, it can uh, sustain water for um, thousands of people. And then the catchment was up here on the mountain. Shannon joined us as we hiked up to the top of the mountain. And it comes down in this pipeline. And then the pipeline goes, next one, Dana. Pipeline goes into catchments that we have down in the villages in the valleys below the mountains. Uh, and this particular pipeline was 60 kilometers and served 30,000 people. So it was a serious uh, undertaking. The next method is a, a hand auger. And uh, it's based on uh, time immemorial ways of digging it. And basically, you just take these two handles and pull this square tubing, and the auger goes down. And there's a high quality drill foreman that's <laughs> supervising <laughs> what's going on. These are some of the tools conditions water, rock, and so forth. And that's a very effective way to go to drill. Uh, we also have a smaller drill rig. And this drill rig is effective uh, from about 100 feet down to 250 feet. And it's actually pulled by a pickup, and it's just on a trailer. This drill rig is a third of the cost of one of the build big drill rigs. And then finally, we have the, so we, so we need to start, should we just start raising our hand? And can you turn it manually? Uh, it's not going. I don't have a computer. Okay. Change. Okay, this is a more conventional drill rig. This drill rig's a million, about a million two hundred thousand with a compressor truck and a gear truck. The little one that I showed you, you pull behind a pickup, is four hundred thousand. However, uh, in some of the areas, particularly in Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia, where you go through the Rift Valley formation, it's a it's a very geologic difficult. And you need the build, big drill rig in order to be able to go down. So we wind up having to use both types of rigs. Other sources of water are small dams and uh, springs that you catch. Uh, and then after we successfully uh, put in a borehole, we come in with a hand pump. And, um, uh, and then we put this concrete pad around the hand pump in order to keep the area clean around the water source. We also have, uh, on larger villages, okay, okay. on larger villages recently, of 500 to 1,000 and more, we've recently gone to solar. And uh, we've tried them for a few years, and now we've got a pretty good installation. And um, we put the panels up and then put a, uh, fence around it, and it's the job of the village to provide a 24-hour uh, armed guard. Unfortunately, our first few installations, the panels all disappeared. <laughs> no different than here. And then the, the basis of the system is the, uh, the uh, pump pumps it up into a uh, above-ground tank. You get uh, gravity then, and you have these water pumps, water points, but you can also have several others. And this is a, a, a site that Shannon and us visited in northern Ghana. And this is uh, very typical. This is the Sohel. Um, it, this is in the process of losing all the green and moving to Sahara. One of the other things that we, one of the other things that we came up with for the first time in this 2010 business plan is a cost per beneficiary. And it's kind of a novel concept. But what, what we found out was that uh, we had to focus on how are we going to get the most benefit for the most people. And we found that a borehole, a drilled borehole with the hand pump that I showed you, might be in the $65 per beneficiary. And that would be water, sanitation, hygiene. But a dam, which requires huge capital investment, might be up in the $120 per beneficiary. So we really refined our cost structure. And this is, uh, I, I wish my steel business 
would show cost like this, but uh, you can see as time gone by, we lowered our cost per beneficiary uh, down to, uh, it's about almost $50 right now. Now some of that's uh, as a result of those hand augers where I showed you the picture of the drill foreman. Some of it's the small rigs and so forth, and we've done better. And of that $50, about $40 is water and $10 is for sanitation and hygiene. So prior to implementing these changes, because of funds and so forth, we were at about 1 million, excuse me, 200,000 people a year, as Dana said, and we've now reached this year 1.2 million people this year. And our business plan says by the end of, by October of 2016, we hope to be at 3 million beneficiaries per year. So it's a very exciting project. Thank you. So Dave has addressed the water part of wash, water, sanitation, and hygiene, and I'd like to talk about the sanitation and hygiene pieces. Sanitation committees are formed at the schools. This is um, a sanitation committee at a school in Uganda. The older children are responsible for teaching the younger children about good sanitation and hygiene practices. They're also responsible for bringing home these practices to their parents. Dave and I had a personal Q&A session with these children. They completely embraced the concepts and experienced the importance of sanitation and hygiene to improve the quality of their lives. The showstopper was their struggle with how to communicate their knowledge with their parents without quarrel um, to incorporate these practices into their lives at home. This is a latrine at a school that was recently constructed in Malawi. It's a model of what we were doing at schools throughout Africa. Though some schools had a limited number of latrines, most had nothing at all, which led to open defecation around the school. The addition of latrines has drastically improved the level of sanitation at the schools, the health of the children, and their awareness of its importance. With the use of latrines, young girls are now staying in school to continue their education. Previously, they often ended their education when they began menstruation. That's an interior uh, picture of the latrine. This is a hand washing station outside of a latrine at a primary school. It's very simple, but it gets the job done and teaches the children the importance of hand washing to minimize disease. As part of bringing water to an area development program, a local water and sanitation committee is established that's responsible for the use of the water, maintenance of the well, and enforcement of sanitation rules. So when we come into a village, um, before we actually agree to uh, drill a well, uh, we have certain rules that um, the villagers have to follow, and you know, we'll tell them, we'll, we'll give you X, but you have to do Y, so that um, we get their buy-in and, um, you know, they value the, the project and the, the well. And one of those is that they have to have uh, a water, sanitation, and hygiene committee to maintain and enforce everything within the village. Um, let's talk about wash at home. Latrines are used to promote safe sanitation practices in the home. Our friend... Sam Diara here is demonstrating the use of the latrine and the latrine cover that World Vision provides to reduce odor and the presence of flies and insects that discourage the use of the latrine. Latrines are located a safe distance from the water supply in close proximity to households to stop open defecation, a very common practice in Africa, which continues to the spread of disease and contaminates water sources. This is another example of a household latrine, a safe distance from the water source and next to the home. Our goal is to have a latrine at every household. Recently, one of our most effective strategies is to have the Women's Sanitation Committee monitor open defecation in each of their villages. The women go out and investigate 
the incidence <laughs> of open defecation in the village and in the fields. And the positive results are that social pressure has become an effective tool to enforce the use of the latrines. This is an example of a household latrine with a hand washing facility just outside of it. They're using a small plastic cup that's perforated at the bottom, allowing water to flow through and wash their hands after they use the latrine. So again, these are all very simple things that we're, we're doing. This is a simple shower. People used to bathe in streams and rivers, contaminating the water source and exposing themselves to waterborne disease. This is a dish storage rack, keeping the dishes up off the floor and away from livestock that can contaminate the eating surface. The dishes are stored face down to reduce the spread of disease from insects. World Vision is emphasizing the importance of a clean cooking area for food preparation to promote better health conditions. This is a kitchen apart from the sleeping structure that's used only for food preparation with very limited access to keep food prep as sanitary as possible. Malaria nets are being distributed for use in sleeping areas to minimize the incidence of malaria. A laundry pad is provided so that women can wash clothes safely and don't have to expose themselves to guinea worm and other waterborne diseases that they would encounter from lakes and streams. All of these measures, though very simple, make a huge difference in the occurrence of disease and vastly improve health and welfare, especially for children who are most vulnerable. These are all examples of the sanitation and hygiene initiatives that the World Vision WASH program addresses. So <clears throat> this is a flag that the Ethiopian government presents to villages where 100% of the homes have latrines. The translation from Americ is open defecation free village. And uh, John experienced this with us and Shannon did. Uh, we would pull up to a village and the village elders were standing in front of this flag. And this was this was big day. This is a big day, and the flag saying, open defecation free village. This is recognition, and it seems to be working very well. Um, the other thing that we've adopted is it's, it's referred to internationally as CLTS, community led total sanitation. And that's that you've got to get a mindset in the community, and you've got to get a mindset in the people that sanitation is more than just providing a toilet. You have to have this lifestyle and so forth, so it's, it's, it's uh, continuing. We actually took that from a group that started that in India and we've adopted it now in Africa. These are our results for 2013, just in, uh, in relation to our business plan and how we did, again, I wish my business would run like this, um, uh, but we, uh, on um, rehabilitated wells, we're 109%, sanitation facilities, these are against our goals, hand washing facilities, wash committees formed, and finally, communities trained in pump maintenance. The India Mark II pump that we use has three gears in it, so that committee of some men and some females that we showed, Dana showed you earlier, uh, we teach them how to uh, do the maintenance. Children are back in school instead of hauling water. Micro Enterprise starts. This lady is in a commune uh, raising chickens. She takes a shift with the chickens and her commune members watch the children and they shift back and forth for income. Uh, part of uh, this school orientation is uh, vegetables. And then this, this, this is what it's all about for us. Dan and I are, are with this little girl and uh, she came in and pumped the water and uh, the criteria for successful well uh, installation is, is that you can walk get the water and return to your, um, your house or your, your structure in 30 minutes. And um, we have wrapped this up now so that at this time in 2014, that's happening, a new well is being installed and a new person is being helped in Africa every 30 seconds. And so that's an exciting day in our lives. And again, a uh, little gal, um, you know, this, this weighs about 30 pounds. It's not a full-size can, but 
She picked it up and threw it on her head, and off she went. Now, Jana has a little special presentation uh, from our recent trip to, to uh, Ethiopia. So um, Dave and I had the pleasure of traveling to Africa with your visionary uh, Drexel president, John Fry, and Professor Shannon Marquez of the School of Public Health. And they were um, amazing travel mates, and boy, did Dave and I learn a lot from Shannon. Um, little did we know that as a result of their visit, we would be expanding our interests to include Drexel student experience abroad in Africa and an online education program to build capacity for our WASH team management. Here we are in Ethiopia after christening a pipeline, along with our longtime partner Steve Hilton of the Hilton Foundation, uh, who's sitting next to John. Here's Dave and President Fry at a drill site. <laughs> the Amigos. <laughs> Here's President Fry and a village chief celebrating the successful installation of a new well and pump in his village. Professor Marquez and President Fry present a Drexel dragon scarf <laughs> to a young Ethiopian village girl who is now poised to be a future Drexel dragon. <laughs> <laughs> so the spirit and joy of the African people capture the hearts of everyone who has the wonderful experience of, of being over there. And um, it just has the ability to make transformational change. This concludes our presentation. We thank you for your time and attention. And uh, I think we'll Shannon. have Q&A at the end. And we'd like to bring up Shannon. Wow. Can we go ahead and switch presentations, please? So good evening. I am uh, Dr. Shannon Marquez, Associate Dean of the Drexel School of Public Health and Director of Global Health Initiatives, as well as the Director of the Dornside Global Development Scholars Program, this exciting new program that I'm very honored to speak about this evening. But first, I really want to take this opportunity to thank Dave and Dana Dornsife once again for the powerful an inspiring message they gave this evening. <laughs> and now, thanks to the support from Dana and David Dornsife, Drexel University has established the Dornsife Global Development Scholars Program. This new program leverages a partnership between Drexel and World Vision in several countries in Eastern, Western, and Southern Africa, where World Vision and the Dornsives have ongoing water, sanitation, and hygiene projects, many of which you saw this evening. In addition to providing funding to work on WASH projects, as Dana pointed out, the program is also designed for Drexel students and faculty to have funded opportunities working closely with World Vision on other WASH related programs and interventions. So including things like environmental sustainability, water resource management, water related illnesses, food security, nutrition, education, economic development, capacity building, monitoring and evaluation, as well as programs that promote gender equity, maternal and child health, and the empowerment of women and girls in Sub-Saharan Africa. As Dana pointed out, this is very important to the overall success of improving the conditions and access to safe water and sanitation. So opportunities are being developed in partnership with World Vision at several sites across Eastern, Western, and Southern Africa. In fact, we're currently accepting applications for international co-ops and summer international experiences in 2015, as well as research field experiences, 
thesis projects, dissertation research in Ethiopia at the World Vision East Africa WASH Learning Center, uh, highlighted there in yellow, as well as Ghana in the West African WASH Learning Center, in Zambia at the Southern Africa WASH Learning Center, as well as in Malawi, also in Southern Africa. So I wanted to point out that these learning centers are really centers of excellence where the information and knowledge harnessed from the work that's been done with World Vision and the Dorn Sives is really at a center of learning and it's complementing uh, this program. So the, the leadership of those centers is actually supporting our work. Not just you, Dana. <laughs> so the Dorn Sives Global Development Scholars Program is open to undergraduate and graduate students from all majors and disciplines at Drexel. And in this regard, tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce the 2014 Dorn Sives Global Development Scholar Award recipients, our first two awardees. Please stand as I call your name, and I'm gonna describe a little bit about their work. Valarissa Baker. Valarissa is an undergraduate biology major and public health minor who's just returned from a six-month international co-op in Zambia where she worked with World Vision on implementing hand washing, personal hygiene, and other sanitation and behavior change interventions that reached more than 200 school-aged children around the country. <laughs> Rithi Sharma. Rithi is a second year master's in public health student who spent this past summer working closely with World Vision Malawi and Mazuzu University on the sustainability of rural water and sanitation and the development of laboratory procedures to test for cholera. Congratulations to both of them for the outstanding work making their mark on the quest for clean water in Africa as the first two Dornside Global Development Scholars. So now, if you're sitting there and you've been inspired by our phenomenal speakers this evening, and you're sitting here thinking about how you can make the mark on the quest for clean water in Africa, consider applying to become a 2015 Dornsife Development Scholar. Applications are currently being accepted on a rolling basis, and the priority deadline is November 7th. For more information on applying uh, for these funded opportunities and with this generous support, all of these international experiences are funded, which is very important for our students. You can contact myself or Idris Robinson, the program coordinator who's also here this evening. Information is also available on the web. We have a resource table in the lobby, and we're pleased to answer questions during the reception as well. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to describe this program this evening, and thanks again to Dave and Dana. school. And thank you, Dana and Dave, for a very inspiring presentation. I'm sure there are many comments and questions from the audience. So we have some time. Yes, go ahead. Do we have a mic or? Okay, perfect. Hi, so one of the things that I found really intriguing about your project is that typically water or big infrastructure projects are financed by multilateral lending organizations like the World Bank. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about sort of the, how you see the role of private donors relative to the big multilaterals or bilaterals. Well, I um, appreciate that question. Um, we've spent a lot of time in Africa. And, um, you know, I need to be careful I say this, but some of these organizations don't learn very well, and Dana talked about mistakes that were made. Well, we make mistakes too, but you keep coming back and you keep giving it right. And what we found uh, was that we, as we made these talks and saw a number of people, we increasingly enjoyed being part of the private group working through World Vision. And then fortunately, we were in a position financially to, put, to kind of make a landmark gift that we did over 
uh, five years, but the terms of our gift is, is that whatever we paid had to be matched before they received it. And that's worked well, and then uh, we've actually expanded that to uh, 15 other countries besides the United States. And uh, at times, uh, government agencies, USAID, come in and join us for a while, but, but when there's, uh, because of budget restrictions and so forth, some of these partnerships, they're in and out. And when you buy a drill rig, you've got to run that for 12 or 14 years, and you can't have somebody on year three say, I'm sorry, I've got budget restrictions and I can't work with. So we just found that the private sector worked real well for us and we've expanded it. That uh, uh, operation through 2016 is over $500 million. So it's a major operation. So thank you for your question. The thank other you. thing that um, I'd just like to add to that is um, that uh, I think water um, is a more popular topic now and people just in their day-to-day goings-on you know when you go to Starbucks you have the ethos water and you know you have um, organizations charity water that um, have really leveraged social media to um, bring the um, this critical problem uh, to us all in our daily lives and so now that we've increased the awareness of it I think the um, the willingness of the private sector to come forth and to realize that they can make a difference. I mean, every well helps, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people. Um, and we've found ways over the last 22 years to do it cost effectively. Um, you know, we're finding that the private sector is really willing to step up. And I think the awareness has made a, a big difference in that. Jenny, you should have introduced yourself. Why don't you, Jenny's a new assistant professor. Go ahead. Yeah, Jenny Pham Cantor. Oh, Jenny Pham Cantor. I'm uh, an assistant professor in the Health Management and Policy Department. Thank, Thank you. you. Somebody in the middle here. Hi, Lucille Pilling. I've spent over 35 years working in the field of global health. I teach uh, Dimensions of Global Health at Jefferson. I also teach at UPenn. Uh, have worked directly with you with uh, World Vision. Uh, basically developing some public-private partnerships with USAID and others. I agree with your cynicism. I agree with working at the community level. Thank you. Uh, one small story, when I was in Ghana, years ago, living in Ghana years ago, my favorite headline was, three men arrested for promiscuous defecating. <laughs> <laughs> my question actually is along the same lines as the one uh, that was just asked. I've done a lot of work with the Safe Hand Washing Campaign, with the Carter Foundation that's done a magnificent job uh, eliminating guinea worm in many parts of the world with a focus campaign. Gates has invested $137 million and just put in some more money um, eradicating NTDs, non-communicable transmitted diseases with medication. I have mixed feelings about that. That's another story. But there, there is a balance of partnership and, and community, and I'm well aware that World Vision has a unique uh, modality of how you work within villages. And I'm wondering, one, so my question is twofold. I think it would be important to share with this audience how World Vision works at the community level, um, and two, do you ever see the openness for some partnerships? I'm kind of, I, 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 I hear your negativity, but I'm just wondering where it, well, where it uh, happens. Uh, first of all, just quickly, uh, World Vision takes this area development program with several hundred to several thousand people and works with them 13 to 15 years with the idea that I said earlier that they become self-sustainable and that they lead. And that's a big part of us being interested in doing it. If you're going to do it right, you've got to do it so that it's sustainable and you can leave and let the village live by itself. The second reason we picked World Vision is, is that we banged around the nonprofit world some, uh, similar experience as you, and we kept coming back to them as having the best people. And, and we, we like their, their people. They currently have 42,000 employees. 
So that's a big statement, but we wound up with the attention of the senior management and almost all of the pictures we showed you in here of individuals are managers in Africa that we know personally and have known for years, and we felt we could get the best results out of this team. Well, we have the same principles in my business. You know, you, your business is going to be successful based on the people that you hire. You need to have a reasonable business model, but after that, your people are going to bring it, and we felt we had the most influence in getting good people through World Vision. That's why we picked that method. I think another aspect to the success of our program is that the, the people that World Vision uses to um, handle their, their local um, water projects within the ADPs are from those ADPs. And so um, it, that goes a long way to gaining their, uh, the villagers' trust and to um, in, you know, engagement and have them willing to let us come in and help. Um, you know, unlike some organizations who might come in and say, well, we know you need this and this is how you have to do it or this is how we're, we're going to make you do it, you know, World Vision is very respectful of the, the local people, their values, um, you know, their, their principles. And um, engaging at that local level uh, really helps to um, like I said, develop that trust and make that project A, possible, and B, give it longevity. And the, the last point is that we charge the people for the water. It's a small amount, well, but we don't. The, the, the water committee, excuse me, the water committee <laughs> charges the individuals. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, a small amount, but that money invests them in the well, it invests them in the maintenance, and in, uh, in some studies that we've done over the last couple of years, having charged for the water, it seems to statistically bring a lot better overall success to your program than if you just hand it out and the people don't have anything invested. Other questions? Yes, they're in the middle. In the green, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Swapna. I'm a second year um, public health student here. I just wanted to know when you first started the program, did you run into any cultural setbacks or differences in any of the countries? And how did you deal with that? Um, well, um, as a female, yes, I can, I can say uh, we, we did. Um, the majority of our work when we first started was in uh, West Africa, which is primarily uh, Muslim uh, communities. And so, um, you know, the women can't talk to the men and the men can't talk to the women and it's very segregated and most of the, most of the um, let's say, negotiations were done um, with the village elders on the male side of things. But what's interesting is that water, sanit water primarily is really women's work, right? And so um, while Dave was negotiating with the, the, the chiefs, I was actually talking to the ladies and, and, and the children who, who were, you know, it's their responsibility, right, to, to get the water and, and to make it all work. And so um, at the end of the day, um, the women got what they needed. And, um, you know, but it was, it, you know, just engaging and, and you know, in, a, in, um, in an acceptable way for their culture, really, that, that leads to the, the success. And we try very hard to make the water committee mixed men and women, if at all possible. Yeah. And we've been reasonably successful with that. You remember you're negotiating with a, a village elder and you're negotiating with this group, and once you get your negotiations done, we're going to bring water to this village for the first time in centuries. And so that's a big negotiating carrot, let's say. And that's been very helpful. Uh, and then, again, we try and use locals to be part of our effort and train them. And, and all that is to help get past those obstacles. But I, I do we also need to say that because we use, uh, do our work through World Vision, you know, World Vision really is the boots on the ground, 
and they've, they've identified the area development program locations. They have engaged at the local level with the people long before you know, we come in. And so it's really to their credit that they understand the importance of the, the cultural and political aspects um, with even just clan to clan or village to village. Um, and so they make the pathway much smoother for us. I, I don't know if you, it, you guys, but in the ADPs, sometimes it takes us three, four, five years before we get to a point where we bring the water because it takes, it takes a long time to, to the bring them around and build the relationship. So that's not a fast process, getting accomplished what you asked. Uh, I'll go over there and then to the back. Thank you very much, good evening. My accent is gonna give me away, so I should just confess right away. My name is Harriet Okach, I'm from Botswana, originally from Uganda. I'm um, a lecturer at the University of Botswana in analytical chemistry, but currently here at UPenn as an MPH second year student. So my question really is on the aspect of quality as an analytical chemist. How much of your work is invested in actually determining the quality of the water? And I ask this simply because of the situation in Bangladesh and India where groundwater, which is supposed to be free of microbial contamination, actually has a lot of arsenic in it. So is this something that um, is a big part of your program? Thank you. Well, uh, good question again. First of all, World Health Organization is very strict about trace minerals in any of the water, and, and uh, we don't want to wind up on our watch in a situation where we turn a, a well over to a village and there's a fluoride problem or arsenic problem. So uh, about 10% of the wells that we drill every year we have to walk away from because of salinity, and we just don't have a solution for salinity. But on uh, arsenic, we... Uh, uh, treat the arsenic by putting it through, we build a box at the end of the pan pump that I showed you, and if the water goes through laterite, which is an iron ore derivative, they use it on the roads and so forth, the water coming out the other end will be uh, treated. The same with arsenic, you use uh, bauxite, and bauxite is the uh, principal ingredient of aluminum. And so in some cases we do treat those. We can't deal with microbes, uh, but we've had very little problem with microbes in, in our work in Africa. It's, and it may be 10 to 15% of the wells will wind up with arsenic or fluoride, and we can treat those. Other questions? Arthur, go ahead. Uh, Arthur Frank, a professor of environmental and occupational health, and it's remarkable what you're doing and having seen other parts of the world. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Asia. This is remarkable work. Thank you. I'm thinking to the future, however, and one of the big issues the world is facing right now are going to be the changes brought about by what we're doing in the rest of the world, namely climate change. And you showed us the one slide uh, at the Sahel, and you know, Africa is changing. The world in many places is going to become more like deserts. How uh, are you thinking about the future and what changes may occur and how that will fit in uh, to your program? Well, first of all, Arthur, uh, for all of the problems in Africa, uh, National Geographic actually ran a special last year. They've been blessed with an amazing aquifer. And, and, and uh, all of our hand wells are between 100 and 300 feet deep. Uh, after 300 feet, the pump shaft becomes so heavy that a, a woman can't overhaul it. But we've been very effective there, and we work very hard with international standards about how close to put the wells to each other and, and, the, and the drawdown. And we have uh, dozens of hydrogeologists on our staff. In fact, when Dan and I are going to be in Africa, uh, in three weeks from now, we're in five countries, and we actually take a Ghanaian hydrogeologist with us. And we're just trying to be real careful to help people, but also be our brother's keeper. And, and I just, we haven't dealt with long range on climate. We're just trying to help these people today and, 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 and follow all of the norms that we can in the educated world about how we protect 
the aquifer. And so that's our general attitude. And then we added the sanitation and hygiene because we weren't satisfied with just the water only in our original effort. And the, I think using the, um, having the water committee um, there to police, if you will, the use of the, um, the, the water so that um, we uh, minimize waste. Um, in many cases, we, we don't actually use the water for agricultural purposes. It's only for um, uh, human consumption, uh, sanitation, and hygiene purposes. Um, you can use contaminated water sources for agriculture. Um, and so, uh, and I, in the beginning of our presentation, Dave actually mentioned a project that we're, we're just um, jumping in on right now with um, ECHO uh, for um, uh, sustainable uh, farming, actually. And um, so we're, we're trying to come up with ways to create stability within a difficult environment um, in a very efficient way to maximize what resources that we have available to us. Our, our, our African brothers and sisters sincerely believe that a part of the famine and so forth is, famine problems as they occur, is because, because of bad water, your system is so beat up and down that when there is a food problem, you're extraordinarily vulnerable to it. And worldwide statistics say that uh, half of famine is because you've got intense diarrhea and you can't keep any of the limited food in your system. So we're just trying to work on those two things and, and, and help them. And uh, the reason we're coming in with the agriculture now is that we hope that the people that we've helped would be stronger physically because they've gotten regular water, sanitation, hygiene. Then if we can bring the food in behind, that's the coup de gras, and, and, and try and get them through this next generation, hope for the other uh, solutions to the problems that you, you mentioned. Right there in the middle. Go ahead. Yes. We're going to give you the mic because people might not hear you. My name is Udoak. I'm a first year master's student in epidemiology at Drexel. And um, I know you briefly spoke about sort of ma maintenance of these um, uh, wells that you provide to um, the communities there in these countries. And so in regards to that, um, how often are these um, systems revisited? And um, if problems are found, um, how do you address these problems or tools provided to, this, to these villages to address these problems? Well, that's another advantage of having um, our part of our team within the ADP from the local community. So our water committees are trained. Um, they know the maintenance schedule, um, at charging a stipend you know, for people. And it's, it's always something that they can afford um, to come in, allows them to um, financially be able to buy the parts and pieces for replacement. Um, if there's a repair that needs to be made. Um, and, you know, they do that on a regular basis. They, they perform the, the maintenance, um, you know, to keep the well working. If once, you know, we're now at a point um, in our work where, you know, it's World Vision's intention to come in and leave, ultimately, and leave the village behind with, you know, empowered, um, with infrastructure and to have everything that they need to be successful on their own. But that doesn't mean once World Vision leaves, and we're just getting to that point now in some of our projects where World Vision is leaving, that doesn't mean that they, that they no longer have, the people no longer have access. So they, they always know who to call or who to contact if the, a problem is bigger than can be solved locally. So, you know, there is that consistency of um, assistance if it's needed. I, if I may j jump in and ask a question here myself. I was wondering, I mean, as you indicated, providing access to safe water will have immediate effects on many infectious diseases. And, but have you considered or been able to evaluate longer term impacts? Because as, as you noted, you know, for example, girls dropping out of school when they get their period is a big, big problem in terms of women's education, which in turn has effects on infant mortality, and that there's all this trickle of potential effects of bringing water <laughs> to people. 
that could be what, go well beyond and have lots of implications for economic development, for education. Have you considered thinking about ways to evaluate that or get a well, handle? An obvious big hope. Uh, when you saw the picture of the, of the women and, and children hauling the water, uh, the minute the well comes in, uh, the kids go to school. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because part of our policies go to before we brought the water, we go to a village where they brought the water, and then we go to a village where there's been the water for the, couple of year, for the last couple of years. And the first thing is you drive in in your land cruiser is you don't see any kids because they're all in school. Yeah. And, and it's our hope that that education process, once you get a second generation educated, that the, that the education will be the key to helping that. But, uh, you know, we've only been at this for 25 years, and, and um, we, we don't get to see the downturn, other than the obvious things of health, ex excited exuberance in the village, and the kids in school. Mm -hmm. And microeconomic enterprise, I mean, we've seen a lot of enterprise pop up within the villages, um, you know, because the women aren't mm -hmm. hauling water, they're yeah. able to do right. things now right, to contribute to the, the well-being of their families. Um, when we first started, we were not keeping track of any metrics other than um, the number of people in villages that were being served by, by clean water. And um, then when, you know, when you go out and you want to start growing a project and you're asking people for money, they start asking good questions <laughs> and then you don't have your data, so then it's kind of like, uh-oh, what do we do now? So about three years ago, right, we, we started um, really being very thorough about monitoring our success and failures, um, incidents of disease, mm -hmm. um, how many children were in school, et cetera, sure. to really, um, and doing, uh, let's call them community surveys, yeah. to try and really get a better handle on those types of metrics so we could better answer those questions. Great. We'd love to do that in public health. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was another, yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Frank Wise. I'm a graduate uh, a long time ago, an alumni. I'm involved with a group called the Puti Village uh, Assistance Organization in Uganda. And I'm, we've been struggling for 13 years in that one village, which is a unique village that has a third of the village is Jewish, which is very unique for Uganda. Ooh. Ooh. A third's Muslim and a third are Christian, but they all get along. And we've been struggling to find partners. How does World Vision decide what part, I noticed my little Uganda there right in the middle, yes. totally, you're all around it, but you don't go in there. How do they decide uh, which well, areas to go into? We, we're, we're working with Kiwanis in the northern part, uh, and we've had a multi-year relationship with Kiwanis, uh, but Pardon? Isn't it Rotary? Uh, it, it's, I'm sorry, it is Rotary. I'm, yeah, I yeah we're, we're Uganda, which is... It, it, yeah, we're in Uganda. Yeah. In That's Uganda. You are. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Uganda's mm -hmm. one of our countries. We've oh, been I, there I didn't several think you times. said that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we, un unfortunately, our last trip, we were in the north part where... Uh, Lord's Resistance. Lord's Resistance Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, John, what's his name? Connor. Joseph Connor. Yeah, very bad. Very bad. That was oh, yeah. a very bad few days of our life. But the the projects we have, various organizations come to us and partner with us. And Rotary's been, but other small groups. And uh, Uganda's tough. Uh, um, we actually use subcontractors to do our drilling there because we've had so much problems with the government and raising people. And part of it is as a result of war. And and with the Lord's Resistance Army coming through the northern part of Ghana, once they moved them out and he went up into the Democratic Republic of Congo where the U.S. is chasing him now, then the people were used to a handout and they didn't want to consider paying us for the water. They said, no, we've been getting it for free from the United Nations. So we've had a tough time and but we're back operating there and all I can say is, is in the different countries, we've got a lot of organizations we work with and uh, I would assume that you can just go to World Vision. But we could also make an entree for you if you want. I'll, uh, I'll explore the World Vision connection. Yeah. Yes. I think we have time for one or two more questions. One more question. I've been told right there in the back. Uh, Kaylee, I think. 
Hi, my name is Rena Patel. I'm a fourth year student within the Laval College of Business. Um, I currently do some work in India, and we're currently partnered with a small organization in Gujarat. Um, so I guess my question would be, when you go to these different regions, do you stumble upon smaller organizations trying to do a similar type of work? And if you do, how do you work to leverage those contacts and those smaller organizations to uh, complete your projects? Well, unfortunately, my answer back is, is that we knew the organization uh, of World Vision. We knew the people. And we said, if you guys agree to undertake this program in just Africa, we will make this multi-year grant to you. But I was just trying to focus what we had going for us on the people and all that. They said, well, what about South America? What about India? And so forth. And we really wanted to get these results, and we said, no, we'd only like to go to Africa. But, uh, you know, we've also spent a lot of time in, our, in Africa. Uh, th three weeks from now will be Dana's 16th trip to Africa and my 34th. So we know the people, we know the countries, and we really wanted to control it. And so uh, we just are not, we don't have the capacity to take on other countries. Uh, that's not a very good answer, but, well, but I'm trying to be truthful. I think we, but you were asking about other organizations too, right? Yeah, so, so we are familiar, and there's crossover all the time of other organizations who, um, smaller organizations, larger organizations, and we're all sort of working toward the same goal. Um, sadly, it's effort that is duplicated, um, but clearly everybody has the same intention, which is to fix the problem, right? We just all have different ways of doing it. And um, in the past, uh, we have tried to work with um, some other organizations. And we're not other organization adverse. I mean, we do actually work with other organizations now. But we've learned over the years to be careful because there is a reason that our program provides sustainability to the village. And it's because we know what works. We, we drill our wells one way, we use the same kind of hand pump, we train the water committees the same way, we you know, follow up on uh, sanitation and hygiene, and we know that in 20 years, there's an 80% probability that those well installations are still going to be functioning. Okay, in the, To just go back and revisit the, um, the World Health uh, statistic, you know it better than I do. After three years, 50% 50%. failure, or 50% are left operating, right? And after five years, 20% of the wells. I mean, can you imagine if you went to work and you said to your boss, you know, I'm going to do this little project here, and I probably have an 80% chance of failure, but you know, you'll stick with me, right? No, we won't stick with you. And so um, we've become very picky, let's say about who we will align ourselves with because they have to have the same standards that you know, we employ in, in working our projects. In a very personal story, in India though, one of our best friends is Ratan Tata, the industrialist in India. And we tried to talk him into doing water in India and Ratan came back no, and Africa. said- in Africa. Well, in Africa, but also India. And Rat oh. Ratan came back and he just said, my passion is, is child survivorship. He said the statistics are so difficult in India that he says, Dave, I've decided not to join you, either in Africa or India. And so I said, well, we'll just stay with Africa. Thanks, Ratan. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's a personal note where we, we did talk about expanding our boundaries. But I, I need a partner like Ratan to get things done. And, and he decided to go a different route. And, well, that's his choice. OK. Well. Please join me once again in thanking Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> we'll stop. I think we have a reception outside, so please. Thank you very much. <laughs>